at the age of 18, his first exit for $40 million. At the age of 25, 26, he had a second exit with Yahoo for $300 million. His third exit was to a public listed company and now he's got a bigger dream for Punjab. His current interest is how he can actually make Punjab a tech capital for India. I would now like to welcome Gurbaksha on the stage and request him to share his dream about Punjab. Thank you. Good afternoon, Sashrikal. I wait for this. It's actually Chinese. So, Punjabi Manu, Chinese. How many of you actually read my book? Us? Punjab? I came to Punjab just lie a little bit. <laughs> okay, I guess we can uh, we can talk a little bit more about the uh, stuff. Uh, so I guess to start off, we wake up in the morning, we look at ourselves in, in the mirror, and uh, a lot of the times when I'm introduced, uh, I'm introduced as an uh, Indian American uh, entrepreneur, and but when I look at myself in the mirror, I'm not, I don't see an American. I see an Indian. I see a Punjabi. I see a Sikh, and uh, that's what I'm proud of. And uh, the more and more older you get, I guess you kind of figure out, okay, what do I do with my life and how can I make it better and how can I give back? And uh, this is, I guess, partly part of my journey. And, uh, you know, the way I see, for every dream, you need to have a very big, big, bold uh, mission. So my dream is how do we make a job the next tech capital by adding one million jobs by 2030? Tech. Now that's a very hard, ambitious goal. But I'm not running for politics. I'm not here to go ahead and uh, uh, you know say something just for attention. I'm here to go ahead and see how we, as a community, can go ahead and take a step forward in that direction. If you look at just uh, tech in general, we have four million jobs in all of India right now in tech. But it is the fastest growing uh, segment for India. We're going to be adding three million tech jobs. In India, so we'll have seven million just in three years. So we're going to double in just three years. But guess where the jobs are going to go? Bangalore, Gurgaon, Hyderabad, Mumbai. A job doesn't even make it to the top 20 list. Okay? We got to go ahead and look at why. And we got to address some of the reasons on what we can do to make that a little bit better. So, how do we go from one million jobs by 2030? So, it takes a lot of things to make that happen. Number one, it's just not me. So I'm not here to go ahead and advertise that I want to get it done. I'm not Superman, I'm not God. Uh, it's going to take a community effort. So that's why uh, more and more events like this, more and more focus we can make by actually having discussions, talking to entrepreneurs, seeing how we can help, how we can go ahead and uh, provide them access to uh, grow, and how we can go ahead and make them achieve bigger dreams. Not just how they can grow in a job, but how they can create a company in the job for the rest of the world. So that also requires a mentality change. But I kind of summarize into six points. Uh, it comes down to community. We have to get involved. Education. Institutions like this need to be uh, more profiled so we actually promote education from early on. Infrastructure. Uh, Chandigarh is beautiful. People want to go ahead and live here. Uh, Jalandhar is also catching up. But that's about it. All right, we have to see if we are going to grow beyond and prepare for 2030, we have to catch up to infrastructure. How do we go ahead and do that? The thing that solves all problems, but also creates them, is money. So we need money. We need outside capital coming in. But what you see right now in tech is almost every week, hundreds of millions of dollars going to different companies in the four cities I mentioned. Uh, the job is kind of just just shaded out. We're basically known for three things. Drugs, alcohol, uh, uh, chaos, and our music, right? Uh, whereas all the other cities are known for entrepreneurialism. So the reason I want to highlight that again is that this is the best time to be an entrepreneur. You're not going to get a better uh, other time. I started 20 years ago. That was not a great time. This is the best time to raise capital, to innovate, to create. It's not going to get any better. So we do not have any excuses. As Punjabis, in Punjab, we've got to give ourselves, we've got to stop giving ourselves a pity party. 
we got to stop thinking that, oh, that's not going to happen for us. It's happening elsewhere, right? Otherwise, I'll be standing here 10 years from now, and we'll just go and say, well, the job lost its chance. We don't want to be that, right? So that's why I'm actually going to go and play a role with the government. I'm going to try to see how we can actually introduce programs where uh, the public and the private sectors can go ahead and uh, uh, create and incubate uh, ideas, companies, entrepreneurs, bring outside capital. Some of the companies, that, uh, uh, some of the cities I mentioned that are getting hundreds of millions of dollars in funding for tech startups, guess where the money's coming from? Some of it, it's Indian. Most of it's Chinese and Middle Eastern. And with big, big firms like SoftBank, international firms like that. So we have that opportunity too, but we need to talk to those investors in the same language without the government. So I hope to go ahead and uh, facilitate some of those discussions. And uh, I think lastly, I, and I think this kind of summarizes my feeling, is that we have to also change our image to the outside world in Punjab. Right? Punjab is really known for two things right now. Unfortunately, the drug problem. And uh, secondly, we're, we're an exit state. You know, you want to be born here and you want to leave. Uh, and what I see that's a pivotal time and pivotal change is the fact that uh, you actually have NRIs in the Bay Area, which is the most expensive place to live. The cost of living is absolutely nuts. And you have them uh, actually looking for opportunities to come back. And they are. There isn't enough opportunities, but there's more talent now willing to move back to India, moving back to Gurugam, moving back to Bangalore, because they want a better quality of life. So talent is coming back. Right? This is really our moment to go ahead and see how we can take a leap forward. So I am going to do a Q&A. I hope to address some of those questions with you. But I guess I wanted to go ahead and just hit a couple of, if you follow me on Instagram or social media, these are some of the quotes I already posted. But I think the biggest lesson in entrepreneurship and in life and in business is a lot of people ask, how do I become successful? Right? Give me some motivation. How do I go ahead and do this? And I think the biggest uh, thing we can all learn is this. Control your mind, control your world. Right? Too much we live in a world where it's negative. We live in a world where people say, no, no, no don't do this. Right? Or just do just about this much. Right? We don't push ourselves. Right? We don't ever have a conversation with people that come up to you and say, you know what, you're doing such a great job. Keep doing it. I see a great path ahead of you. The only person that's going to do that, though, is you. That's it. It's not going to be uh, your next door neighbor. It's not going to be your best friend. It has to be you. And you have to have that powerful mind because there's so many other people chasing that dream. So many other people that want to go ahead and be successful. The difference is they want more. They want it bad enough. And they don't really care about what people think. Because that's our number one problem as a community. We think too much about what people think. Right? We think too much about uh, how this is going to go ahead and affect so-and-so's family or so-and-so's world and so-and-so's. We worry so much about other people that we stop to worry about us as individuals. So I would say if you're thinking about entrepreneurship, if you're thinking about, if you're thinking about life, right, be powerful. Have that beautiful, controlled mind that looks at the future in a positive way. The world's too negative without it. Uh, conquer the world before the world conquers you. It's kind of plain and simple, right? Uh, it's a vicious world, vicious world out there. If you're going to be in business, let me tell you this, that is the most dangerous sport on this planet. You have to be the most uh, vicious athlete to want to go ahead and compete in. So if you don't go ahead and prepare yourself for that environment, you're not going to go ahead and stand a chance. So you have to have that within yourself. Conquer it. And noise. You know, one thing I hate, uh, I hear a lot from people is, uh, actually, let me ask you, how many of you guys have haters? You know what haters are, right? People that don't want good for you. I hear that a lot, right? Especially from uh, younger uh, kids and people my age, a little older. Uh, and they say, I have too many haters. I have too many people that don't want good for me. I have people bringing me down. I have all this thing. But the reality is, that's just noise. The minute we spend energy on what other people think and want to bring us down, 
how is that going to ever give us clarity and mental clarity to actually do something positive? But what difference makes is when I wake up in the morning, I want to be able to say, that's my competition right there, <laughs> right? I want to be able to go ahead and have that drive. Because if you don't, what you're going to end up having is uh, uh, spending 10 hours of your day on thinking why you can't when you could have spent that time doing what you could. Uh, and that kind of goes back to, I think, part of it is that what I've seen is this Technology has brought so much closer to uh, people, so we claim uh, it's gotten us so connected, but everybody's depressed now. Everybody is basically has some form of depression, some form of mental anxiety. And that's why I think that this needs to go ahead and also change. We need to put the phone down, and we need to say that, forget about what people think. If I'm going to live my life, I need to live my life for me. Right? Ignore that noise. Ignore that signal. It doesn't matter if people don't click that like button. It's okay. Right? Life will go on, I promise you. But uh, we need to go ahead and uh, you know, take that. The one thing no one can take from us is our happiness. So we got to own it. We got to like ourselves. Uh, problems. Right? We all have them. But you know what we love doing? We love talking about other problems. We love talking about uh, uh, what other people's problems, what other people don't have that problem of. Right? We love saying, oh, hey, the palaveche, the personal person problem, right? Hey, these and these have to. Right? We just can keep comparing ourselves to the fact that somebody else's life is so great, and that's why we can't succeed. Right? Because we don't have a great life. But let me tell you something everybody has problems. You just don't know. Warren Buffett has problems, right? You just don't know. I have problems, <laughs> right? You just don't know. And you have problems. Stop comparing it, right? Stop. And stop making that as an excuse. Because when you make that as an excuse, what are you really doing? Wasting energy, right? No, no, no solution offered, just problems gained. And that's why the two words I kind of look at is added and minute, right? Behavior and discipline. Those are the only two things that are going to make you. Right? I don't like waking up at 4.30 in the morning to go to the gym. Right? Uh, I, uh, I work 16 hours a day because that's what I'm used to. It may benefit. Right? If I don't have my other than this, what am I ever going to be? Right? So change your clock. Right? I only sleep three hours a day. I'm not saying do that, but don't go out. Right? Don't drink. <laughs> Take a day off for that. Try to do something productive with your life. Right? And uh, make things that you don't like to do, but will be good for you, your other. Because that's the only step forward. In order to be successful, you have to understand what pain is. Right? Too many times people have even looked at my success and seen the headlines and said, you know, in the way, it is in the end, it's not going to be here. Right? It's a cool. Right? Right? That's just the way we think. Right? We just want to go ahead and say, uh, it's luck. Right? Uh, but what it really is, and I'll tell you the secret, is it's pain. Right? Something we don't like doing. It's pain, and we have to get used to pain. So work so hard that pain never feels the same, right? Because when we when we're used to pain, right? Uh, oh, I didn't get enough hours of sleep. I don't say that. Anymore. Get used to pain, and the more successful you are, is going to be not just waking up. That's just a sad excuse. I'm saying your mental uh, strain that you have to prepare for. Right? That is what you have to conquer. You have to conquer your mind. Right? And the only way you're going to do that is it's going to go through hell. Right? And you got to prepare for that because that's what pain is. And pain actually is good because it prepares you. It prepares you for one thing. If, uh, if you can endure it, you're alive. That means, you know what? You can go ahead and uh, keep going forward. That was just a test. And uh, I've been through a lot. Uh, it's become so strong 
that the only person that can get in your way is God. Right? So, I'll tell you what that means. I know with my fourth company, I'm going to be successful. But the only reason why I wouldn't want to be is going to be probably because of them, because I'm going to give my all. Right? I'm going to sacrifice everything for it. I'm sacrifice money. I'm sacrifice time. I'm going to sacrifice blood, sweat, tears, whatever it takes. I'm going to do it. So if for some reason I'm not successful, I left it in his hands. It's not like the other mentality, which is like, right? He's only going to give it to you if you work for it. Right? <laughs> Don't believe in no, uh, no janam patri kunli stuff. Right? right? You make your own janam patri. But based on the effort you put in. Right? I was 16 years old when I started. I didn't know what fear was. Right? You know, <laughs> that was kind of my mentality. It was like I was fearless. But the older we get, oh my God, and it took, we become so fearful. All we can think about is, oh my God, I can't do that. Oh my God, this is going to happen. You become so afraid of everything. The older we get, because why? Going back to my root cause, we keep thinking about what people think. We keep thinking what society is going to think. We think, what are people going to think when I post that picture? They're not nonsense, right? But the older I've gotten, I've realized you have to be fearless. And you have to make risk your best friend, right? You have to make that your best friend. You can't live in fear. Uh, and I'll tell you this. How many of you guys think I'm a confident person? Just one, two, come on, man. Pajaba, I'm a problem. The reason I asked is uh, the most important thing that you can wear is not your shirt, not your tie, not your shoes, not your belt. It's your confidence. So wear it proudly. Right? And I'm comfortable, comfortable here because I'm, I'm able to talk to you about stuff that I am passionate about. I love business, there's no doubt about that. I love entrepreneurship. I love the job, right? I think you can feel that. And that's the thing, when you're, when you're being real, that's when your confidence shines. Because you actually have something that you feel so passionately and confident about. So wear it every day in the morning, proudly. Because that will go ahead and exude confidence in your day-to-day -day life with everybody else. They will respect you for it. You'll respect yourself for it. And that's why you never want to underestimate the power, the sheer power, of human will. You know, uh, there are many times that we do things and we talk ourselves out of it. There's many times that uh, we think it's too big of a battle because we have too many shit there right now. Too many problems. What, what, you want me to do that? So here I am saying, I want to create one million tech jobs in the job. When we don't have the infrastructure, we don't have the education, we don't have any of those things, right? But one thing I see is I see 100 to 300 people here. You guys came here, three day notice. That shows me there's a community here that cares. That shows me that people here are worthy of wanting to go there and make a positive impact in their lives as well as their community's lives. That's step one, right, of achieving whichever monstrous dream you want. So in ten and a half years, I hope we can all celebrate that we actually did it. And that goes for your individual dreams, right? Think astronomically big, whatever you want, right? Because that's the only way you can do it. It's not worth having small dreams. Because you know what? Once you achieve it, life will be you. I think the, the secret to life, I'm not talking like a Buddha, but I think the secret to my life, what I've realized is, is, is realizing your purpose. Right? When you have that, you have everything. Right? And what I mean by purpose is, I have a picture on my phone with me and my grandmother. Every time I look at it, I realize what sacrifices she made, and at that moment, the feeling that she was giving me, the power of love. That defines my purpose. That defines my reality. I want you all to have a similar type of purpose, a similar type of emotional attachment to your goals, to your dreams, because that's when I'll go ahead and let you take a step forward in, in achieving them. So that's why I'll end it by saying, work so hard that you continue to make your parents proud. Thank you. One thing I definitely learned, I think, uh, from your motivational speech is 
we're fine with a smile. I think we all need to get up as entrepreneurs in the morning and make sure that we have a big area audacious goal that we keep moving every day forward. Uh, just as a next uh, you know, thing, what I've done is all of you we actually requested to send some of your questions that you would like to ask Gurbaksh this afternoon. What I did is I actually picked the four that were most common and I'm going to ask these four questions to Gurbaksh and then leave the floor to all of you to ask your individual specific questions to Gurbaksh. So I think the first one, everyone wants to know what makes a startup successful. Uh, there's several ways to answer it. Uh, in business, uh, business is ruled by profit. So, in order to be successful, you have to have a pathway, a pathway to it. But how do you get there? You get there through talent. You get there through human will. You get there through uh, hard work, discipline, ambition. And that requires the right type of people. That requires the right type of mindset. And uh, those are the people you want to surround yourself with. And those are the support centers that you might have. Whether they're your employees, whether they're your co-founders, whether they're your family. Okay, thank you. The next is, what's the best way to approach an investor? Ah, this is a good one. Because I get a lot of emails. And, uh, you know, everybody thinks, you know, hey, yeah, check the paper, you know, right? I say, if you're going to reach out to anybody for help, you need four things. You need a one-sentence introduction. My name is this, this is my company. Then you need to basically say, what do you do? But it has to be sexy. It has to be like, what is it? Don't say, uh, uh, I manufacture plastic. Bro, I don't care, right? <laughs> really, nobody cares. Uh, but if you say something related to is relevant, you're going to actually catch their attention. That sentence too. The third thing is comes down to, uh, uh, you know, what exactly do you want to, what is your vision? You already described what you want to do, but what's your big goal? Because people like to back people with big goals, not people that just want to do day and day make plastic, right? They need to hear what you are and what you're really about, what you're thinking long ahead about. And the fourth thing is, don't ask for money. Don't. That's the long, wrong thing to do. If you're approaching a venture capitalist, that is the best time you do your homework and you check out their portfolio companies. And you find out who have they invested in, who have they backed, and what have they accomplished. And you save the last fourth line to actually say, I love what you did with portfolio XYZ. I would think that it would be great if you can introduce me with ABC. And I'd like to go and accomplish that. Something that actually gives them some sort of uh, uh, inclination that you actually want to help them out. Because once you help them out, guess what? The checkbook opens. I start my day at 4.30 in the morning, and I end it at midnight. Uh, I go to the gym two hours a day, uh, not because I want to look good for Instagram, but uh, because I just want to feel good throughout the day. So I, I need to go to an hour of party in the morning. Then I go to work, and I stay to work. And here's the thing, it's not that glamorous. A lot of people say, oh, I want to shadow you. Why? I'm going to be behind a keyboard typing. <laughs> It's not that it's not that exciting. Or I'm gonna be in meetings. Or I'm gonna be on the phone. It's just not that exciting. Success is normally really is doing uh, a lot of uh, a lot of boring work, exceptionally well. That's what success is. That's what the truth is. It's not no Hollywood script. It's not no movie where you just see like, oh my God, so much action happens. There is drama in business. Believe me, <laughs> I've had my fair share. But uh, it, for the most part, it's really boring. Right? And even after I come home at 7 o'clock, I go back to the gym because I've had an exhausting day and I need to go ahead and figure out that I can actually accomplish something. Because here's the reality of it. In a typical day, what nobody wants to talk about is we have a lot of crappy days. Right? We'd probably be lucky if we have one uh, a great day to celebrate in a month. Right? Because for the most part, it's like, oh man, that didn't happen. Oh man, that got delayed. Oh, I gotta do this. Right? We don't really have anything that we can celebrate every day. So I kind of use the gym for that. At least I'll get here, exercise get here, right? And then I go back into doing my emails. So I work 16 to 18 hours a day. It's, uh, it's because I love it. And so long as you're doing something that you love, 
the clock becomes just a number. It falls of being a very highly successful entrepreneur. My success came at a very young age. You know, 18, selling your first company. Nobody really does that. Uh, and then at 25, having a monstrous success. And then I think when I agreed to be on Oprah, that's when my life changed. That's when I basically went from being just a tech dude to being a good luck shop, right? And that created a whole stem of problems, whole stem, right? And I wasn't ready for that. And I'm sure in normal daily lives, we deal with them. There's a lot of negative people in this world. There's a lot of people that want to take advantage of you. And here's the other thing I realized, 99% of the world doesn't want to work. They just want a shortcut. They just want to steal. They just want to lie. They just want to go ahead and put so much drama in your life because it accomplishes an easy exit for them. But I also have to be, feel that there is a, uh, you know, I'm a very religious person, I'm a very spiritual person, so I have to believe the laws of karma work. As long as you're honest, as long as you're good, you know, you, you will lead, leave and lead a successful life. Everybody's going to have good days, everybody's going to have bad days. No one's success is final. That's why, you know, I don't really like these accomplishments, these big numbers, this and that, because uh, I'm actually a very private person, right? But uh, this is all noise to me, because it, it makes the, a bad culture of uh, people chasing money rather than chasing substance, right? Like, I, I worked hard when I was 16 because I wanted to uh, look out for my family. Never did I dream at 16 that I'd sell my company for 40 million. That just happened. That was the byproduct of hard work, right? That wasn't the goal. A lot of people I meet say, I want to be on Forbes magazine. Okay, I became a millionaire. I want to be a billionaire now. Why? Right? Why? Like, I'll tell you this, the secret I learned, being successful and being anonymous is the secret. So the more successful you can become and you can celebrate it then, with the people that cherish you. You can celebrate it then with the people that were there for you. And you can go ahead and appreciate the most with yourself with the time you get. How do you identify, you know, you brought that disruption to innovation. How do you identify that, that you know, you can bridge the gap between what customers need and what can you offer them? You basically created a need through whatever you did. So how, as we, uh, you know, to make a successful company tomorrow, how do we identify that? I'm a B2B entrepreneur. And the difference between B2B is it works on supply and demand and you creating value in the middle. Some technology, software, whatever it may be, but you're connecting supply and demand. Uh, a lot of the companies we hear about the most are B2C companies. They're the ones that we get to use, uh, we get to hear music on, the ones that we get to do fun stuff with. That is a very different way to succeed. That requires a lot more capital, that requires a lot of moving parts to actually be uh, be successful. So I'm not saying B2B is an easy, I'm just saying my expertise is in that. It's gonna be very, very hard for me. And I've tried to do some B2C stuff, I just failed, right? My, my thought process is so engineered to uh, economics and supply and demand. So depending upon what you're trying to uh, create, know where you're starting and know that not any individual success story is gonna be your case study. Right? Do not look at, this guy became successful because he did this. That's not going to be reflective for you. You sometimes have to be at the right time the economy is. Sometimes you have to work on based on the right trends that are, are, are coming in. And that's what makes business. That's what essentially drives economics. Right? And I think too many people spend time online researching success, hoping to imitate it. And we shouldn't do that. My question would be, be that, you know, we see a lot of these tech startups coming up, you know, a lot of them closing down every day as well. And that is the new, you know, the kind of the thing in there, the in thing. And, you know, on the other side, if you look at what the industry was doing in the past was a lot of brick and mortar. So how, what is your take on, you know, what is a good industry to get into maybe? Or like, you know, what are your thoughts on tech business versus brick and mortar, you know, because at the same time, if you look into the, the barrier of entry into the brick and mortar is a lot higher versus what is in a tech and the success rate of a tech, you know, the chances of growth are also a lot lesser. So, so I think, that's a good question. I think uh, sector-wise or things that I see that are going to be most destructive, 
I'm blockchain. I'm just kidding. Uh, it's going to be really three things, I think, in the next three to five years. And if you can pick an industry that can create value, and you can be able to go ahead and create uh, profit out of it, a revenue business out of it, then more power to you. AI, right, is another effect every industry, every industry. And it's re-engineering the way we even consume the current things that we do. Um, uh, IoT, right? With the explosion of 5G, that's really going to be kind of the precipice of how devices really go beyond the phone. And we'll be able to see what other businesses really come from that. So I think that 5G is really going to go, even though IoT is already a very big thing, it's just going to go ahead and even be more for the coming uh, years to come with, with the explosion of 5G. And the last thing, data sciences. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys know, but last year was the first year uh, technology companies that actually rely on data make more money than oil. That's why people call data the new oil. And that goes with uh, the third thing, data sciences. I think the way that the explosion of data, I think the explosion of, uh, of the, uh, the data sets that are going to be out there, there's going to be a lot of predictive modeling, predictive uh, 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 automation that we'll be able to do across industries. So the way you look at data and consume it and build some things around it is also going to be interesting. Suppose you're working on two projects, like both are big in the sense that it requires, like they are asking a lot of time from you, and you are pushing your limits and working for 12 to 14 hours every day. And, but still there are times then when you feel that you're not justifying to either one of the projects or something. So would you still, what would you like, would you still continue pushing your limits and work and try to work both the projects parallelly or uh, would you say that it's important to work on one project at a time? And if you want to do one thing, you put it all your all, all your energy, all your focus, all your determination, uh, you will, two things will happen. First thing is, hopefully you're successful. If not, you're going to learn a lot to figure out what didn't work, why it didn't work, and potentially what you could pivot to. So I'm, I, I hate it when I get emails from people saying, I'm working on this, 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 this. And I'm like, I can barely go ahead and run one company, right? And you're trying to run 10, right? And people do that, and I don't know why. Maybe it's insecurity or so forth, but you want to focus on just one thing. Because you're betting yourself on it. And nothing comes to life 50%. You gotta go 100%, even more than 100%. So give it your all, pick one thing, learn from it, and hopefully you're successful. What is your process for validating an idea? And how has it evolved from your first startup to the current ones you are having? And I ask this because uh, it's, uh, uh, because uh, I have had a few ideas, around 100 of them, and I said, third year, <laughs> they won't work, right? So it's like, um, uh, if you want to go all in on an idea, like you want to work even 20 hours or 18 hours a day, and you need to have that at least a, uh, some kind of a confirmation, right? This idea is good, it's uh, better. So how is that process, uh, what is the process you follow for that validation? Any mentoring uh, you received in your first startup? When you're thinking about what you want to build and you're putting it all 100% energy on it, uh, you want to be able to go ahead and say, okay, what kind of gratification am I getting out of it? Am I learning something? Is it progressing forward? Can I build something out of it? How do I actually make money off of it? How does it connect to my bigger vision? Right? If you're just goofing around or if you're going to talk yourself out of it, that's just, I don't know what you're doing. But if you're asking the right questions and you're spending the right time, uh, your beginning journey will lead to a successful journey. Okay, one, one more thing. So mostly, if you think about an idea, most of it, uh, most of the times, you find that it's already there. So how do you make it different, or uh, I mean, do you pursue that, or you just leave it? Make it better. My question is how we can overcome the fear from switching to job to entrepreneurship. Because, uh, like, um, as 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 we work in some companies, we like we're getting salaries, we we're paying our bills, and now we, we are kind of in our own circle, and uh, kind of uh, we have uh, also built liabilities, but we want to like uh, go to entrepreneurship as well. 
but there is a uh, you know fear that what what would happen because initially there would be struggle definitely my quick story is, is that i was 16 years old when i started my company in my bedroom and uh, i would work uh, you know in the library lunch time and as soon as i came back to school i go back on it well how i did it but i did it but then the time came 3 months into it i had saved up enough money and i went to my father who wanted me to be a doctor and i told him i'm ready to drop out of high school <laughs> not a really good conversation i had but i did have it and even he looked at me and said you know what as long as you do this for one year if you work hard and you can go ahead and take measures so it becomes a transition right and then say okay i'm willing to make the risk and here's the thing trends i'm not saying do something 50% 50% you have to do your work 100% dedicate yourself toward a dream that comes to reality and you transition into it but know that life is going to get a lot difficult right that's why i basically kind of use the analogy because it's not really an analogy it's true life is pain but you got to go ahead and make pain not feel the same